Good morning to you all, and again, welcome to Calvary Chapel of the Palm Beaches. We are so glad that you have come out to worship with us today. And we do not take your coming for granted, because we know there's a lot of churches around. There's a lot of ministries around right here in this area. We also know that you could have stayed at home and stayed in the bed and turned on the television or turned on the internet and got some of the best preaching, some of the best teaching in the world. But yet, you chose to come here. And so we don't take that for granted. We are glad that you are here, and we pray again that today your worship experience will be bountiful. Now, I began our time today by quoting to you a passage of Scripture that's near and dear to my heart, but also to many of your hearts as well. It comes from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, where the Lord God said to his people, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. Are you listening? These are the plans that the Lord God has for his people. It's good for us to know that. It's good for us to grasp that because sometimes even as the people of God, we say, well, God, we don't know what you're up to. God, we don't know what you're doing. But God tells us in that passage of Scripture, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the Lord says to his people, I know the plans I have for you. Plans, again, to prosper you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. God wants you to have hope, and God has already planned a great future for you. But as we've talked about many times, and especially over the last few weeks, as we've been talking about faith and walking in faith and growing our faith and building up in faith, in order for us to walk into the good things that God has in store for us, we have to step out. We have to take steps of faith. And so again, over the last few weeks, we were talking about this study entitled 40 Days of Faith, which again is all about how that the Lord God wants us to grow in faith so that again, he can walk us into the good things that he has in store for us. So in that first study, we talked about expecting the best expecting the best. And we said that we, as the people of God, can expect the best of God because of who he is. Are you hearing me? We, the people of God, can expect the best from God because of who he is. When we know who he is, when we know his character, then with confidence, with assurance, we can expect the best. In that second study, we talked about how that If we are expecting the best for God, we should be preparing for the best. Makes sense, right? If we are expecting the best, we should be preparing for the best. It's kind of like when a a woman is expecting or when a woman is pregnant. Now, the further along she goes in her pregnancy, the more she prepares All of a sudden, she goes into mommy mode, and she takes a room in the house or a certain section of a room in the house, and she puts in a a bassinet or she puts in a crib, and then she goes shopping. She goes out, and she buys a little bitty baby clothes. Isn't that cute? Look at that. And she gets a little bitty booties and everything, and she gets together with all her little girlfriends, and they just laugh, and they go, that's so cute. She's preparing. She's expecting, and so therefore, she prepares for what she's expecting. And so it should be with you and I. If we are expecting God's best, we should be preparing for God's best. Now, today what we're going to be talking about is this. We're going to be talking about one of the ways that God wants to grow our faith. We're going to be talking about future faith. Growing our faith by taking risk. So let's begin reading. We're going to be reading the story that's familiar to most people. 
This is where David goes up and he faces Goliath. So let's begin reading right there in 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start right there in verse 45. And it says, David said to the Philistine, which is Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, without a sword. In his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, sword rather, and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that the hero was dead, they turned and ran. Stop right there if you will. Let me have your attention and let's talk about this. Let's talk about what it is, again, that the Lord wants to say to us. Because always remember, when we're going through the Word of God, the Word of God is speaking. The Lord is not just putting something out there for us to just uh, look at. But he's putting things out there for us to grasp hold of, to take down into our hearts. Now, today what we're going to be talking about is this. We're going to be talking about future faith, which requires that we take risk. Future faith, future faith requires that we take risks. Now, when I'm talking about taking risks, I'm not talking about doing something crazy. I'm not talking about going out doing something that's just, again, crazy. No, when I'm talking about taking risks, I'm talking about taking a step to overcome the gap that stands between you, that stands between us, and the good things that God has in store for us. Let me say that again. When I'm talking about taking a risk, I'm not talking about doing something crazy. I'm not talking about doing something foolish. I'm talking about doing something that is going to cause us to cross over that cavern, to cross over that gap, to cross over that space that stands between us us and the good things that God has in store for us. And so again, we have to take a step. See, because here's the thing. Taking that step seems like it's something small. It seems like it's something insignificant. But in that gap, in that cavern, in that space between us and God's best for us, Man, are some of the biggest, most scariest giants that we could ever even imagine. And so, again, it takes us taking a risk. Now, here's the thing I want you to know about taking a risk. When you take a risk in the will of God, what you are actually doing is this. You are making a faith investment in the future. When you are taking a risk in the will of God, what you are doing is you are making an investment in the future. Now, notice I said taking a risk in the will of God. Now, how do you know if it's in the will of God or not? If it's in the will of God, it's going to line up with the word of God. So you should never have to go through the word of God and try to find an obscure passage and try to make it fit your scenario. No, God's will is plain. God's will is simple. And so, again, when we take a step of faith in the will of God, what we are doing is, again, we're making an investment in the future. And so we take 
And we grow our faith by taking risks. Now, in that, in that risk taking, there are four major things that we have to look at. And they all spell out the word risk. The first one is R. The first one is R. And what the R stands for is this. It stands for remembering what God has done in the past. Remembering what God has done in the past. See, no one understands something. God does not change. He does not change. The Bible says this, and please write this scripture down. Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it says this. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what I also like about Jesus and I like about God is the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. And what that means is what God is willing to do for one, he's willing to do for another. See, a lot of times we look in the Bible and we see, well, God did something great or God did something fantastic in this person's life. Or we hear about somebody that we know, a contemporary, a neighbor, a co-worker, and we see, well, God did this great thing in their life. And we're going, oh, man, well, God did that for them because that's who they are, because they deserve that. But the Bible tells that none of us deserve any good thing, Amen. So God is not a respecter of persons. And the cool thing about that is, again, what God will do for one, God will do for another. And so, when we understand who God is, when we understand the character and the nature of God, then it's easy to take a step out on that. In fact, check this out. Listen to what David did as he was about to go out and face Goliath. David says, I'm going to face him down. And everybody told David, no, 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 David, you can't do this. You can't do this. But listen to the words of David. It's found in the same chapter, chapter 17, but found in verse 37. David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, would deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So in other words, David remembered what God had done. And because he remembered what God had done, he knew what God was capable of doing. Are you hearing me? David remembered what God had done, and therefore he remembered Oh, he knew what God could do. And so he says, man, wait a minute. Hold up, hold up. The same God, the same God that delivered me from the bear and the lion is capable of delivering me from this Philistine. One of the things that we must understand is faith, true biblical faith, is a faith that is based upon facts. It's not a blind leap into a dark cavern. And it's a shame, again, in so many circles out there, we made faith this thing that we can shape and we can move. And so we think faith is, you know, a, a name it and claim it, a blab it and grab it, or we're going to declare it and decree it. No, faith, true biblical faith, is faith that is based upon facts. David, because he knew of the facts, of how God slew the bear and how God slew the lion, knew that God could slay this giant because he remembered what God had done. He knew what God could do. And I'm going to show you how that that worked out in my own life. Some of you know Part of my story of how that when I came to the Lord, I had a Murphy's Law type experience. In case you don't know what Murphy's Law is, I pray you never have to find out. But Murphy's Law is anything that can go wrong will go wrong. 
That's how I was when I came to the Lord. Oh, man, I came to the Lord. I was all excited, and, man, this is going to be great, and this is going to be just ease on down a yellow brick road, and it's going to be great. And, man, I walked into the faith thing and got ran over by a truck. Bam! Within weeks, first I got into a car accident, sitting at a traffic light. Guy runs into the back of my car, smashed my car all up. So because I'm an outside salesman and I use my car for work and I don't have a car, I lost my job, right? I mean, within about 30 to 60 days, I'm like, okay, this is going well. You know, this is going well. Came to the Lord. You know, okay, my car is totaled and, you know, I don't have a job and, you know, but guess what? When you don't have a car and you can't get around and you don't have a job to go to, you have a lot of time on your hands. And so I occupied that time. When God saved me, he gave me an unquenchable thirst for his word. So for hours upon hours, every day, I'm reading the word of God. I'm fasting and I'm praying and I'm studying the word of God. But here's the thing. During that time, I was off. And I was off for, I was say three, almost four months. During that time, I didn't miss anything. During that time, without a job, because I had good credit, I went out and bought a brand new car. That was faith, right? Oh, now I'm going to pay for it, but hey, I got good credit, so let's go for it. (laughs) But during that time, God supplied everything. Even if you ask me to this day, how did he do that? I don't know. I take it back to an Elijah experience. Every so often while I'm by the brook crying, the Lord would come by and drop off a little meat. The Lord would drop off a little couple of uh, crumbs of bread. But you know how it is when you're in that place. You don't want crumbs, uh, crumbs of bread. You want a whole loaf. Amen? So I'm like, God, I thank you for this, but where's the whole loaf? Long story short, months went by. No job. But God met every single need. Every single need. But then guess what? As the old committee used to say, a funny thing happened on the way to the farm. Years later, I go through the same thing again. But this time, I got a wife and a brand new baby. And oh, man, I was freaking. Oh, my God. See, it's one thing to go through by yourself. But when you have a family, it's a whole different ball game. And if you come from the type of family that I came from, where you had a dad breathing down your neck, boy, get it done. Boy, handle your business. When you become a man, you handle your business. It's not your wife's responsibility to go out and work and handle that. My mom, my mom worked, but she worked because she wanted to, not because dad wasn't providing. So he drilled that in us. Handle your business, boy. Handle your business, boy. Handle your business, boy. If you're a man, take care of your family. Take care of your family. Take care of your family. And I got a wife and I got a baby. And I'm going, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. But in the midst of all of that, God spoke to my heart and said, hey, I'm the same God that brought you through by yourself. And I can bring you through this. And guess what? He did the same thing. But then it even got worse. Years later, going through, we had crises in the church, right? And now I'm going, God, God, God. It was one thing for just me and another thing for me and my wife and the baby. But now, Lord, there's a couple of hundred people in the church. Lord, how are we going to do this? And And I can't breathe. God says, I'm the same God that took you through when you were by yourself. I'm the same God that took you through when it was you and your wife and the baby. I'm the same God that's going to take you through this too. And guess what? He did. He did. See, remembering what God has done can help you to understand what God can do. And when you understand what God can do, then you can step out upon what God's word says in faith. But again, we all have to, again, take risk. So, again, remember what God has done in the past. And here's the cool thing about the scriptures. When we go through the scriptures, 
And we understand again that God is not a respecter of persons and that God does not change. We can look at the experience of somebody else and their experience can become our experience. You following me? Because we know that God does not change, that he is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent, we can look at what God did for somebody else, see their experience, and their experience can become our experience as we step out. But again, we have to take risks. So the first letter in the R is remembering what God has done. The second letter is I. Invite God to use you today. Invite God to use you today. The Bible in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12, in verse 1 it says, therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, when you see therefore, at the beginning of a sentence, is therefore a reason. And the reason why it's therefore is because it's connecting everything that was said before then. And what was said before then, the author of that, the author of Romans, again, which is Apostle Paul, took 11 chapters, 11 chapters, and he talked about who God is, what God has done, who God is willing to work with. And then he says, and therefore, and therefore, because of all of that, it's only reasonable. It's only reasonable, as the King James would say, it's only reasonable for you to take this step. And so, again, we have to ask God to come into our lives and to use our lives. Plus, what we need to understand is this. If we want our lives to have any type of meaning, if we want our lives to have any type of significance, we have to ask the Lord not only to come into our lives, but to use our lives. If we want our lives to have any type of meaning, any type of significance, not only do we have to ask the Lord into our lives, we have to ask the Lord to use our lives. I don't know about you, but I want my life to have significance. I'm not looking for statues. I'm not looking for monuments. I'm not looking for, you know, a a library named after me or a street named after me. I'm not looking for any of that. But I want my life to have significance. I want my life to make a difference in the lives of people who come to this church. Not just because, again, we speak in the word, but because we're ministering to you in your life. You know, one of the greatest things is to see somebody come into church who is broken. And their life change. See, because when one person in the family's life is changed, then the family dynamics changes. And so I want my life to have significance. And so when you ask the Lord again, not only to come into your life, but to use your life, what you'll find is this. You'll find doors of opportunity begin to open. Now, we like the idea of being used by the Lord. Oh, man, when we look in the Bible and we see how the Lord used David and how the Lord used Samuel and how the Lord used all of these people, we like the idea of that. But then again, sometimes, again, that risk factor is a little, makes us a little nervous. Sometimes we look at uh, Daniel and the lions then and we're going, yeah, Lord, I want you to use me, but I don't know about them lions and all that kind of stuff now, Lord. You know, Lord, maybe, maybe uh, uh, a pussycat with a bad disposition. And I might be able to handle that with them big lions. But again, when you ask the Lord to use your life, he brings significance to your life. Listen to this. This came from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul said this. I do not account my life as of any value 
nor precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. See, God wants to work in all of our lives. Nobody is exempt. God called us in, not for us just to sit, but God called for us in so we can be a, a beneficial to other people. God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. God wants your life to have significance. And so again, when we ask the Lord to come into our lives, we ask the Lord to use our lives, he begins to open doors. But the thing is this, we have to step out of our comfort zones. And sometimes that's a little scary, amen? Which leads us to our next letter, which is S, which stands for step out of your comfort zone. Step out of your Comfort zone. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter uh, 16, in verse 25, Jesus said, Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Again, whoever will save his life will lose it, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so we have to take those steps. If we play it safe, if we stay within our little comfort zones, a couple of things happen. First, we miss out on the joy of life, and then we miss out on the excitement of life. When we stay within our little comfort zones, we miss out on the joy of life but also the excitement of life. Again, God didn't call you to be ordinary. God called you to be super extraordinary. God said, I called you and I made you the head and not the tail. God says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God says, I've given you power to overcome all of the forces of darkness of evil, to trample on all of the forces of evil. That doesn't sound like an ordinary person to me. God says you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you. Again, that doesn't sound like he's calling us to some ordinary, just boring uh, life. No, God has great things in store for those who love him, and he wants to use us to bring great things into the lives of other people. But again, the only way for us to experience those things is we have to step out of our comfort zone. We have to step out. Again, when we step out, we experience the joy of life, but also the excitement of life. Can you imagine, can you imagine getting to the end of your life going, man, I wonder, I wonder if, I wonder what would have happened if I would have stepped out? God gave me gifts. God gave me skill. God gave me talent. I wonder what my life would have been like if I would have stepped out. See, some of you sitting here right now can think back on opportunities that you had. You look back at certain things, and you go, and even to this day, man, I just wonder. I wonder if I would have went for that. One of the things I always look back in my life, you know, when I was in high school, I was, you know, I always, always been an athlete. You know, but in high school, you know, I used to play football. And, man, many days I look back and I go, I wonder. I wonder. So I got into the thing where I was like, you know what? Hmm, playing football. Hmm. See, I grew up in, uh, you know, during that time and era that was uh, the 60s era, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, so I say, well, sex, drugs, and rock and roll is better than football. So I went that way. But then even to this day, I'm going, man, I wonder. 
There's other things in my life when I look back and I go, I wonder. Can you imagine getting to the end of your life? You're 60, 70, 80 years old. And you're looking and you're going, man, God gave me this skill and God opened this door of opportunity. I know people who, who've turned down jobs because it was just, you know, they just thought it was too big. I know people who had college degrees, I mean, not college degrees, had uh, college scholarships who didn't take the scholarship because it's, oh, no, no, nobody in my family you know, has ever gone to college and I might mess this up and so I'm not going to do this. Go for it. Again, understand something. God is not going to call you to do anything. He's not going to give you the power to do. And so, again, we have to take risks. As we take those risks, as we step out, the Lord is right there. Again, the Lord wants to bless us, which takes us down to our last letter, which is letter K. And that is to know that God is with you. Know that God is with you. If you have been a Christian for any length of time, I know you've heard the saying that God will never leave you, that God will never forsake you, but he'll be with you to the end of the age. Amen? And so that means that wherever you go, God is with you. Check this passage of Scripture out. Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1, in verse 9, the Lord told Joshua, Have I not commanded you to be strong and to be courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now check out the scenario. Joshua, nation of Israel, have been following behind Moses for 40 years. Every problem, every situation that came up, everybody ran to Moses. Moses would go talk to God, get the answer, lay it all out. God took care of it. But Moses is now off the scene. Moses is gone. And the Lord goes to Joshua and say, Joshua, I want you to lead the people into the promised land. I want you to take these people into the promises that I've given them. And Joshua is freaking. And how do we know he's freaking? Because the Lord says, did I not command you to be bold, to be strong, to be courageous? And so what does that mean? He wasn't bold. He wasn't strong. He wasn't courageous. Because if he was bold, if he was strong, if he was courageous, the Lord wouldn't have commanded him to be bold, to be strong, and to be courageous. Amen? But the man is freaky. And God says, I will be with you wherever you go. And if you know the story, they went into the promised land. And so, again, sometimes, again, if we're going to uh, accomplish and do that which God called for us to accomplish, we have to take risk. I remember being one time at a, uh, at a pastor's conference. And in one of the sessions, one of the speakers challenged us. He challenged us to step out and do something in the name of the Lord, that scared the life out of us. And I'm like, huh? Step out and do something that scares the life out of you. And me as a pastor, me as a speaker, first thing that came to my mind was teach the book of Revelations. So I don't know if you know about the book of Revelations. But there's a lot of stuff in the book of Revelation. There's stuff that's past. There was some stuff that was present at the time. There was some stuff that was the future. There was some stuff that was symbolic. 
you know, all mixed together. Right? And so you have to, like, you know, get out your decoder, decoder code, code, you know, and break this thing down or open this thing up. And, you know, when that, when that thought came to my mind, I knew it was from the Lord because I was shaking like Don Knotts. I'm like, oh, it's the book of Revelations. Oh, my God. Oh, God. And I'm like, well, are you going to stand up? Are you going to man up? Or are you going to be a wimp? And I don't know about you, but I know me. And I know when a challenge comes up, I better move then. Because if I put it in the closet, it's going to stay in the closet. So I said, okay, all right. I got up. When that session was over, you know, big campus, I went down to the campus bookstore. And I bought, I think, about four or five books on the book of Revelations. You know, from just scholars in those particular subjects. And over the next months, I devoured. I devoured every single one of them. And I said, okay, all right, let's go for it. And I taught the book of Revelations. Now, some of you know this, some of you don't. For years and years and years, we had a radio broadcast entitled The Encouraging Word, because that's my heart, to encourage people. Out of all of the studies that we put on that radio, we got more response from the book of Revelations than any other book. And that was just God's way of saying, I told you, I told you, I will be with you wherever you go. And so right now, again, the Lord is calling. The Lord is calling some of you again out of your safe place. We grow our faith by taking risks. Again, not crazy stuff, not dumb stuff, but stuff that we know is in the will of God. Things like, hey, go up there to the high school. Go to the middle school and minister to those kids. Go to the high school. Go to the middle school. Go and draw them out. Go and be light in the darkness. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. As we talked about this morning, go to the, to the nursing home. There's people in the nursing home who are lost, forsaken, forgotten. Go in there and let them people know that I, the Lord thy God, I see thee. I see you. I hear you. I am with you. That's the will of God. Going in, working on your marriage that's in trouble. That's the will of God. And so the Lord says again, first of all, of yourself and by yourself, you can do nothing. But I, the Lord says, will give you strength so that you can accomplish all things. And so again, we grow our faith, we stretch our faith, we exercise our faith by taking risks. Are you hearing me? We take our faith or we grow our faith by taking risks. The Lord our God is with us wherever we go. So here we are. Here we are. We're in this new community. As I've told you many times before, the Lord didn't call us here for us just to sit here. The Lord didn't call us here for y'all to come in and look cute. And y'all look cute. And ladies, you're looking good. You're looking good. But he didn't call us here to just to be big, fat sheep and sit here in the pews and enjoy the AC. He called us here to work. He called us here to labor. And every single person who is here today, God has given you a gift. And God has given you a skill. As we said so many times before, it's hard by the yard, but it's a cinch by the inch. And so when every single person does their part, we can get it done. There's hundreds, there's thousands of people who are around us right now who are lost. They're on their way to hell and damnation. But God has called us for such a time as this to snatch them from the very gates of hell, from the very fires of hell. We got a lot of things that we're trying to do. Phase one was, again, us getting in. We're here. Now, phase two is 
again, we have to get the modular building because even today, the children's ministry is just overflowing. We don't have enough room. So we have to go ahead and get the modular building so we can put that on there so that we can grow the ministry, so we can grow the children's ministry. And through that, as I've told you many times before, then we'll be able to do the daycare. We'll be able to do the after-school care, which, again, will help us to have a bigger uh, uh, fingerprint or footprint in the community. But we have to take risks. We have to step out. Hmm. I just thought about, and we're done with this. I thought about Peter. When Jesus came walking on the water, Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come to you. And Jesus said, come on. Jesus told Peter to come on, and he gave Peter the ability to walk on the water. And we know that he walked on the water for a time until he what? He started looking at himself. He started looking at this, the winds and the waves. And he says, I can't do this. And because he said he couldn't do it, he started to sink. But as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can walk on the water. We can do that which the world and even ourselves sometimes would say, is impossible. Amen? Amen. And let me give you some things to hold on to from today's study, and we're done. Lesson number one, taking a risk when it is in the will of God is a faith investment in the future. Taking a risk when it is in the will of God is a faith investment in the future. Number two, faith, biblical faith, is faith that is based upon the facts of the nature and the character of the God of the Bible. Again, faith, biblical faith, is a faith that is based upon facts, the facts of, again, the character and the nature of the God of the Bible. And number three, in order to live lives, to be truly, in order for our lives, rather, to be truly significant, we have to take risks and trust God. In order for our lives to be truly significant, we have to take risks and trust God. Let's pray. Well, let me give you today's challenge. I'm sorry, let me give you today's challenge. Today's challenge is this. This week's challenge is to do something this week for the glory of God that frightens you. Do something this week for the glory of God that frightens you. Right there, something jumped in some of your minds already. You already got your orders. You know what it is. Don't go to sleep on that thing. Step out in that and watch and see. Watch and see if God doesn't meet you there. And when you see God meet you there, man, I'm telling you, that's going to bring an excitement into your heart. That's going to bring an excitement into your life. And that's going to bring, again, favor into the life of the person or the situation that you stepped into. So again, please, walk that out. Do something this week for the glory of God that frightens you. See, this is how faith becomes reality. Faith without works is dead. So some people think that I have faith because I believe something intellectually or even emotionally. But no, true biblical faith is seen as in actions. 
Some of you know the passage of Scripture where it says you believe in God, good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. So the demons have an intellectual faith. They know that God exists. The demons have an emotional faith. They know that he exists and they shudder. But they don't have a soul-saving faith because they don't move out upon those things. So again, this week, move out. And I guarantee you see God meet you right where you are. And when you see that, it's going to do something great for your life.